Um, I guess it's nine o'clock. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started with this uh, today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jam Okunov. I'm a fellow at the University of California, Irvine with the Department of Urology. And it's an honor for me to mo moderate uh, today's session, today's webinar. We have the privilege to have uh, Dr. Ralph Clayman. He needs no introduction, but briefly, he's a distinguished professor, endowed chair in endourology with the Department of Urology, and he's the Dean Emeritus with, uh, at the University of California, Irvine. He's one of the pioneers and thought leaders in the field of urology, and today he'll be speaking on stone trees, medical management, and urolithiasis made simple. We'll be taking questions during the uh, lecture and at the end of the lecture, so please post your questions in the Q&A section of the um, Zoom application. Dr. Clayman, please. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to be able to present this. Uh, it's something about which I feel passionate. Uh, I think this very much speaks to the, uh, the internal medicine side of urology that is um, part of every, uh, should be part of every urologist armamentarium. And I think when it comes to stone disease, the urologist truly owns the malady from diagnosis to medical treatment to surgical treatment. Uh, and I think it's really important that we maintain that ability. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, no specific disclosure with regard to uh, this lecture, but just so people are aware of the companies are, with which I work. An overview of urolithiasis. Um, again, it's interesting, the ratio of male to female is actually decreasing. It used to be two to three to one, now it's down to 1.5 and 1.2 to one. Uh, peak age 20 to 60, um, again, location has increased in the south. The United States prevalence has been increasing over the years, and recently it's been stated that it may be as high as 9 to 11 percent. The incidence is 0.1 to 0.3 percent per year and over 600,000 cases per year, with a recurrence rate of 40 percent at seven and a half years and a cost of $2.1 billion per year making urolithiasis the most costly of all urological diagnoses. The only political part of the talk will come up right now. Um, so for those of you who believe in climate change, um, what's gonna happen is predicted that by 2050, the stone belt will move all the way north into the state of Oregon. So uh, stone disease is gonna just continue to increase and even more so in the northern states. Um, I think, again, as part of the evaluation, it's very important to view yourself as um, both an in, as an internist who has the ability to cut. And from that standpoint, um, my good friend Guy Valenciennes once said, uh, Ralph, you need to understand that all around the stone there is the patient. And then he would look at me and said, but you're from the United States, so all around the patient there are the lawyers. But be that as it may, we really need to look at the whole person when they come to our office. And as such, the metabolic syndrome, which is so prevalent in the United States, needs to be identified in your office for the patient who's obese, has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cardiovascular disease, erectile dysfunction, type two diabetes. These are the individuals coming to you and their first presentation may be with a uric acid or a calcium stone. And it's up to you to diagnose the other parts of this syndrome and then minister to them and get them to the right uh, physicians for those treatments. The other thing is to realize that some of your patients are going to have osteoporosis and osteopenia and in the recurrent stone former with calcium oxalate stone disease they are at an increased risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia and so if you've got a patient coming to you with their third episode of a calcium oxalate stone they're relatively young it would be a good idea uh, to get a, a bone density on these patients. As far as the evaluation of the stone patient, it hasn't changed much over the years. You want to look at the electrolytes to rule out renal tubular acidosis, to rule out hyperparathyroidism, and to rule out gout. Those are the three major rule outs you can do with regard to the laboratories you obtain. Uh, parenthetically, if the pH is six or greater, you could skip the uric acid, the serum uric acid. You want to get the glucose and the lipid profile, again, for consideration of metabolic syndrome. I have to admit, I still like to look at the urine 
Uh, we spin it, I look at it. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> in the upper right-hand corner are calcium oxalate dihydrate crystals that are very common. Doesn't mean that that's the composition of the stone necessarily. And if you see them in the urine, doesn't necessarily mean that someone has a stone. On the other hand, the bottom right-hand corner is a classic cysteine crystal nested a bunch of, amidst a bunch of calcium oxalate dihydrate crystals. But that's a diagnosis right there and then a cystinuria. Stone analysis, obviously, if they capture the stone, and as I mentioned before, in the young patient with multiple recurrent stone episodes, a bone density. pH is very important to the urine. Again, why I like to do an in-office urinalysis. Uric acid, that pH should almost always be below six. Uh, the pK for uric acid is 5.5. If you're looking at cysteine, the pH is almost invariably lower than seven. For alkaline urine, you're not gonna have a struvite stone unless the pH is above 7.25, and then your calcium phosphate comes in at a pH of greater than seven. But the two key things here are the uric acid, which you won't get if the pH is above six, and the struvite, which you won't get if the pH is below 7.25. So when do you do a metabolic stone evaluation? We'll do this in the patient is a first time stone patient, but comes in with multiple stones. If they have a history of multiple stones, if there's new stone formation um, while we're following a patient or stone growth, and if there's a strong positive family history, all of these are justifications for doing a metabolic evaluation. The 24-hour urine collection that you're gonna get, I like to think about this in, in four categories, the solute, the promoter, the inhibitor, and then the internal standard. The internal standard is creatinine, and you always wanna look at the 24-hour urine creatinine because if it's low, you've been shortchanged, and if it's excessively high, they've basically given you a 24-hour urine plus however long they slept the night before. So you really want to look at that 24-hour urine creatinine at, at the get-go before you look at all the other parameters so you don't fall into the trap of making diagnoses that are there, not because they're real, but because the person did not give you a true 24-hour urine. And then for solute, you look at calcium, oxalate, and uric acid. Promoters are sodium sulfate, monosodium urate, and then the major inhibitor is citrate. Those are the things you want to look at. Some helpful things that you might want to just remember. Um, if you multiply the 24-hour urine urea by 6.25, that's pretty much an indication of how much protein is in their diet. If you divide the millimoles of sodium excreted by 44, that's pretty much how many grams of sodium they have in their diet. And if you divide the millimoles of potassium in the 24-hour urine by 25, uh, that pretty much is how many grams of potassium they have in their diet. These are helpful things to know, especially if you're trying to have somebody on a low sodium diet or you're asking them to decrease the amount of protein intake that they're doing, especially animal protein. So how accurate is a 24-hour urine? There's been a lot written on this, but um, I like the paper that was written by Stuhl Wolf and John Asplin, basically saying that you really need two 24-hour urines over seven days. They don't necessarily need to be back-to-back, -back. <clears throat> but in, among 70,000 patients when they did two, they found that half of them had more than a 20% variation in two measurements. 30% had more than a 20% variation in citrate and oxalate, and 30% had more than a 30% variation in calcium and urine volume. So you really want to take a good look at two 24-hour urines. So I will usually have patients go on what I would consider an optimal stone prevention diet, which is drinking three quarts of fluid a day, limiting your salt intake to two or three grams, normal calcium intake, and after talking to them about what foods are high in citrates. So I know when I get my two 24-hour urines, it's the best that they're gonna be on a recommended diet. And then here's the stone tree. There are only eight potential diagnoses that we're going to go over, um, and I'll go over each of these and how the diagnosis is made. But basically, you're looking at a stone. It's either calcium or it's not calcium. And if it's not calcium, 
it's a problem with uric acid, an infection problem, or cystinuria. If it's calcium, specifically calcium oxalate, you're looking to see if they're normal calcioric or hypercalcioric. If they're normal calcioric, it's a problem with the promoter, which in this case would be uric acid, that's monosodium urate, a problem with an inhibitor, citrate, or a problem with too much solute, not calcium, but oxalate. On the other hand, if they're hypercalciuric, then you want to look at the serum calcium, because if it's elevated, then they may have hyperparathyroidism. And if it's normal, then it may be a renal, a bone, or a gut problem. But in this day and age, we're not trying to, dif to differentiate among those three for treatment. So let's look at the diagnostic gate and look at the first, if you will, part of this, which is you have a stone, it's calcium and your normal calciuric. What's the problem? It's a, promo it's a promoter, inhibitor, or solute problem. So if they're hyperurecosuric with calcium oxalate and some uric acid mixed in stones, then you still want to rule out the possibility of gout. Malignancy chemotherapy can increase your uric acid. The urine uric acid is high. The serum uric acid may be normal or slightly increased. And in these patients, the urine pH is usually above six. So this is not a pH sensitive form of disease. If they lack the inhibitor citrate, Think about renal tubular acidosis. Take a look at your electrolytes again. Think about a short gut syndrome or a metabolic acidosis. The urine citrate is dropped. In renal tubular acidosis, your serum potassium is low, your bicarb is low, and the, chlorine, the chloride is increased. Calcium in the urine is usually normal, and the urine pH is always over 5.5 if they have RTA. Remember, this is inherited as an autosomal dominant with variable penetrance, so family members may be involved or, or affected. The sodium chloride load test used to be done. I haven't done one of those in 20 years, and I don't know of anyone who's still doing them. If it's a solute problem, so they're normal calcium with calcium oxalate stones, then the oxalate may be high. They may have primary type 1, in which case your urine oxalate is commonly above 90 milligrams. Alternatively, more commonly, they have either an enteric or idiopathic etiology, the enteric being a bowel disease or after extensive bowel resection and they absorb more oxalate, or idiopathic, which may really be just secondary to diet, either a high oxalate diet and or a low calcium diet. Let's look at the second trident. So you've got a stone, it's a calcium stone, and the patient is hypercalciuric. In that case, look to the serum calcium. It's either going to be increased or normal. If it's increased, you want to rule out hyperparathyroidism, get your serum PTH level, that's going to be increased. Another little few pocket calculations. Uh, in, in hyperparathyroidism, the chloride phosphorus ratio may be over 40. Obviously, your calcium's increased, both total and ionized. Your serum phosphate is decreased. Calcium in the urine in these patients is commonly over 400 milligrams. So you want to take a good look, and that's a good diagnosis to be able to make. You don't want to be the uh, urologist and miss the patient with hyperparathyroids. Hypercalciuria is going to give you basically three potential causes. It's coming from the gut, the bone, or renal leak. In these patients, though, typically your serum calcium is normal, your phosphorus is normal. The PTH may be, if you get that, increased with a renal leak. Urine calcium is increased. If we look Mr. at the, Clement, there's yeah. a There's a question from the audience. Yeah. Um, so, so the question is, what if the stone has multiple constitu uh, constituents and or changing stone composition or UA with more than one abnormalities in terms of diagnostic and treatment trees. Okay, so your calcium oxalate stone may have uric acid in it, and it's thought that maybe the calcium oxalate crystals form on uric acid crystals by epitaxy, but the bottom line is it's really, you look at that as a calcium oxalate stone that's been initiated by uric acid. And that's a total, or monosodium urate, which is a totally different animal than the uric, pure uric acid stone. That's really key to understand. As far as we'll get into this, a patient with multiple abnormalities, 
Um, we always try and go with the simplest treatment first. That's the goal. And what we usually do, if we do a treatment, then six weeks later, we'll get another 24-hour urine to see what's going on and see if the treatment is working or not. Now, I think that's key. And if it is, then I'm fine and I just follow them with the x-rays. And as long as they don't have new stone growth or growth of a pre-existing stone, I'm not going to repeat the 24-hour urine. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So moving on, if it's not calcium, you're looking at uric acid infection or cysteine. And then for each of those, remember with the uric acid stone, serum uric acid may be normal or increased. An old saw is that 20% of people with uric acid stones may have gout. Uh, urine uric acid is usually increased. The urine pH is always less than six, unless they have something like less nyan disease or some other abnormality where the, the amount of uric acid is just so overwhelming. Remember when you go from a pH of five to seven, uric acid solubility increases 20 fold. But think about that they may be on chemotherapy, uh, they could have an overwhelming malignancy. Uh, the metabolic syndrome, keep that in mind. And then the most common cause of this is ex excess purine intake and protein gluttony. So look to your urine, uh, urea and stuff like that to figure out how much protein they're taking in. On the other hand, if they have struvite stones, it's a urease splitting bacteria. Proteus pseudomonas klebsiella, the pH is always over seven. Formation product for, uh, or pH for struvite is 7.25. And again, the key question that comes up on the boards all the time is the fact that the one bacteria that is most commonly associated with stones, but is never a urease splitter, is E. coli. And lastly, cystinuria. This again is an autosomal recessive. Only the heterozygotes get stones. The genes for this have now been identified. This is the cola disease. Cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine are malabsorbed, if you will, across the gut and also in the proximal tubule in the kidney. Interesting here, your stone presentation largely is gonna occur before the age of 20. The urine test is a cyanide nitroprusside test, which is positive if they're making more than 250 milligrams per liter of cysteine. Um, the only nice thing about this disease is it seems to taper off as people get into their 50s and 60s. So if you do the metabolic evaluation, this is old data from Charlie Pack in there. And remember, this is a referral institution. so. The majority of their patients were hypocitraturic, but patients also had hypercalciuria. Interestingly enough, I think the most common thing in my practice is low urine volume. Uh, they only noted that in 23%. But what I would like to call your attention to is the fact that if you do these two 24-hour urines, you will find an abnormality in basically 99% of patients. And this is why it makes no sense to do a full metabolic evaluation in an individual with no family history who comes into your emergency room with a solitary stone that they pass. Because if you do the metabolic evaluation, you may wind up putting them on medication and they're never gonna take it. They're not gonna take all that medication if they've only had one stone episode and no risk factors. So the next part of this is what do you prescribe? And there are only a few drugs, um, but the first thing you want to prescribe is absolutely nothing. What you'd like to prescribe is maybe a good cup of coffee, but certainly enough fluid that they get to 96 ounces a day, three quarts a day. That's the goal, because you want them to make two and a half liters a year in a day. That's the goal. So more important than anything else, five times more important than all the drugs and everything else is the fluid intake. A nice study here by Curhan and Associates, what should you not drink? You should not drink your dark colas. 
the Pepsi Cola, the Coca Cola, the Dr. Pepper, all that stuff. Those are the things to not drink. Water is good. What's better than water is actually orange juice. And I'll show you there's a nice paper by Amy Cranback looking at high levels of citrate in diet orange juice from Kroger. So your fruit juices can be very high in citrate, lemonade, lemon juice. What's better than that is actually caffeinated coffee. And then this is, this is always a pleasant visit because my people come to see me love this because what's better than coffee? Glass of red or white wine. And when I was in the office with Homer Simpson a few weeks ago, he was ecstatic because what's better than red or white wine? Beer. So the bottom line is 96 ounces a day. These are all good things to drink on top of water. I will take some time to speak to my patients to find out what do they do during the day and try and work out a scenario in which they can get 96 ounces a day into them. So if they're on the go, it's a two-quart thermos. If they're at home, it's a two-quart pitcher in the refrigerator. And if they're at the desk, it's a two-quart decanter. Make sure it's filled in the morning, empty by the end of the day. And then everything else around that will probably get them to the three quarts. What to eat? Normal calcium diet. That's key. A relatively low protein diet. And again, that's controversial, but again, it's one of those things for them to consider. And a relatively low sodium diet. And again, this is somewhat controversial. The only thing on this slide that isn't is a normal calcium diet. But if they can moderate their protein intake and moderate their intake of salt, that's beneficial. Because again, the higher their salt intake, that may result in increased levels of calcium in their urine. This, if followed, can give you a twofold decrease in the risk of recurrent stone disease. But again, this is nowhere near as effective as high fluid intake. If diet and fluid intake are failing, what do you do? Well, we go back to the stone tree again, and you're gonna see there are only a few drugs that you need. There's only nine drugs that you need to know about to literally treat all of stone disease, just nine. So if you have a stone, it's gonna be calcium or not calcium, and it's the same stone tree, because if they're normal calciuric, you're gonna to wanna to treat a problem of a promoter, an inhibitor lack, or an ex excess of solute. So in the case of a patient with calcium oxalate stones in which the urine uric acid is elevated, you need to get that down and that's gonna be the one and only case when you're gonna be giving allopurinol. You're not gonna give allopurinol here, only here. Now, allopurinol at 100 milligrams twice a day, it's, it's a competitive and a non-competitive inhibitor of xanthine oxidase. So you get xanthine building up instead of uric acid. Uh, very interesting, um, you know, it's only uh, humans and uh, Dalmatians that have this, this problem with xanthine oxidase because we don't have a uricase enzyme to break down uric acid. Side effects of this are not insignificant. You're gonna to need to follow the patient and we will usually get a, a panel at one in six weeks and then routinely on an annual basis to look at L liver function studies, CBC, to make sure none of this is going on with them. I have to admit in, in my experience, and I hate saying that for what it's worth, 100 milligrams twice a day seems to be very well tolerated. I will, for some people, even start it out at just 100 milligrams a day. Now, if they have a calcium oxalate stone and they're lacking the inhibitor citrate, this is where you get into potassium citrate as tablets. Some people don't like them because the tablets are big. You need to take two of them upwards of three times a day. Other people will take the crystal packets. They like those better. Uh, litholite, which is a combination of potassium citrate and sodium citrate is another easy way to go. It's a, it, you mix it with fluid and it's a crystal. Um, the bottom line is you gotta increase the urine citrate level. Side effects for potassium is you look for hyperkalemia and we usually will get a 
serum potassium in a week and six weeks to make sure they're not getting hyperkalemic. Some people will stop because of GI complaints. But you know, uracic K is costly uh, and that's a problem. And so you have to be careful as to what you're prescribing, um, but this will cost you up to $600 a month. Litholite will cost you up to $87 a month. So this is the litholite, $96 on this slide, 87 on the other one, but it's a combination of potassium citrate, magnesium citrate, and sodium bicarb. We have been giving this to our patients. Um, it is, uh, they have tolerated quite well, and I've got quite a few patients on it, so I'm a fan. Uh, potassium citrate tablets you can buy, and you can get them at generic, and then instead of 600 a month, it's 120. The cheapest thing of all is sodium bicarb tablets. That's $12 a month, but then you have to be careful and watch and make sure the calcium in the urine does not go up. Now, this is from Amy Cranbeck, and this is now $67 a month for the uh, Kroger's Low Calorie Orange Juice or Crystal Light Lemonade. That's down to $6 a month. The least expensive thing is baking soda. And if you can take a teaspoon of that in water, uh, that's basically 34 cents a month. So something to think about, especially if you're working in a population that really is impoverished, you can treat them and treat them well with baking soda. You have to be careful about the calcium going up in the urine, but this will work. And remember, that's one teaspoon that they're taking. It's only 1.2 grams of sodium. It's not as bad as you think. For the patient Dr. who's- Clement, Yeah. Doc, so, um, there's a question from the audience. Uh, they're asking to comment on duration of the treatment with these medications that you mentioned. Yeah, I hate to tell you, um, I tell people they'll probably be on this forever. Now, I do have patients on treatment and you know our usual follow-up is after everything is said and done, we'll get maybe a low dose, non-con CT, kidneys only at a year. If there's no stones, we'll get another one in a year. If there's still no stones, then we'll get one in maybe two years. If there's still no stones, at that point, we'll probably let them go. And you're right. You know, we may tell them they may be able to come off treatment, but I've not done that. I, I usually tell them they need to stay on treatment. Um, but I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, hey, let's get another two 24-hour urines and see if everything's back to normal and uh, with you off your medicines. Perfectly reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Pyridoxine. Uh, so, controversial. So, this is a patient with calcium oxalate stones who has hyperoxaluric. Uh, this works well if you've got type 1 uh, hyperoxaluria, which is rare. For the enteric or idiopathic, it's really questionable as to how well this works. You can go up to 400 milligrams a day, um, but again, I don't know. Side effects, hardly ever seen. You need to be get over two grams a day. We now have a prospective randomized study looking at exactly how well this may or may not work in patients with idiopathic uh, hyperoxaluria. I really think that for the idiopathic, it really comes down to diet, normal calcium diet with meals with a low oxalate, but we'll see. But this is something you can do. It may be about a little bit like chicken soup for the dead individual. Um, it won't help, but it may, it may help, but it won't hurt. Calcium citrate, I have a lot of people, if their 24 hour urine calcium is within normal limits, then I will have them take two tablets uh, with their major meal of the day to make sure that they have calcium coming in while they're eating to hopefully bind the oxalate and absorb the citrate. So important to explain to the patient that this is not a medication, this is a condiment. This is like your salt and pepper, it goes on your dining room table. So as soon as you sit down to eat, you take your two tablets of calcium citrate. It's absolutely harmful if they decide for whatever reason to take this in between meals, in which case their urine calcium will go up. 
Magnesium oxide, also somewhat controversial, 400 milligrams a day. But you know, these are all things that you can try to see if this will help your patient who has idiopathic or enteric hyperoxaluria with urine oxalate levels that are usually in the 50 or 60 range. What's on the therapeutic horizon? Uh, Jim Lingeman uh, recently put out a report with Guillain Perec on this medication, which really is just um, oxalate decarboxylase that you get from uh, the oxalate formigenase that's in the gut. Um, their preparation actually gets by the stomach, uh, so it, it's not degraded in the stomach. And they had 16 patients. They tested it in the 16. Of note, it did not work um, in, in several of the patients, in a third of them, and basically five of them. And among those in whom it worked, you got a modest decrease in oxalate of 10 to 15%. Um, so again, of interest, could be helpful in the future, um, but is this gonna cure the hyperoxaluria? Likely not, but it may help enough to bring down the supersaturation for calcium oxalate. But I can tell you, even at 8.8, .8, people are gonna be forming stones. Our goal for supersaturation for calcium oxalate in our patients is to get them well under four. That's our goal. All right, next. You have a stone, it's calcium. You're hypercalciuric, and your serum calcium is either elevated or normal. If it's elevated, this is a diagnosis of, um, of hyperparathyroidism, and that patient's gonna be going off to surgery, and they'll find an adenoma. If on the other hand, the serum calcium is normal and they're hypercalciuric, that's when you're thinking about a diagnosis of, you know, in poly, it's coming from the gut, the kidney, or from the bone. And here we usually give chlorothaladone. And this is gonna increase calcium absorption in the distal and proximal convoluted tubule. And there'll be less sodium reabsorption in the proximal, but increased in the distal. I usually give I'll start some patients at 12.5 a day, but I usually like to start them off at 25 milligrams a day. And if they don't tolerate that, then I'll drop to 12.5. Contraindicated if they have a sulfur allergy. Important thing to remember. Half of these patients will develop hypokalemia, or and then there's a whole host of other potential side effects. And you, you know, we always get another 24-hour urine six weeks after they're on this to look at the, not only the, what it's doing to the calcium, but is the citrate dropping, is the oxalate going up? I will commonly give this with 20 milliequivalents of uracid K. So they'll take 20 milliequivalents of, of potassium citrate at night, and then they'll take their chlorothaladone in the morning. We get a potassium at one week, and at six weeks, we get a 24-hour urine at six weeks, and then I see them again at eight weeks to review what's happened. An alternative to the thiazide diuretic is indapamide at 1.2 to 2.5 milligrams a day. This also works, but realize this is cheap. This is expensive. The other thing is hydrochlorothiazide, they need to take it twice a day. And I like chlorothaladone, therefore, because it's once a day. Last part of the trident. Uric acid, struvite, and cysteine stones. Uric acid stones, you need to alkalinize the urine. That's gonna be with potassium citrate or sodium citrate. This will alkalinize your urine. Check your pH three hours after the dose. The goal, you, you'd like to get them up to 6.2 to 6.8. You don't wanna get them above 7.5 or they'll start precipitating calcium phosphate. Remember, dietary citrate will not increase the pH. So the citrate you're getting in your lemon juice or in your orange juice is not going to increase your pH. The other thing is no allopurinol. It is not a first-line drug for these patients. Struvite stones, you gotta get them stone-free because as everyone in the audience knows, if you crush up the stone, it'll grow out the bacterium. That's the goal. What about acetohydramic acid or lithostat? It's a urease inhibitor. It's one of the most clever drugs that's ever been invented. 
the problem is there's so many side effects that it's very hard for a patient to stay on it. I personally have not had a patient on lithostat um, literally in 30 years. The AUA guidelines panel says you can use it as a supportive measure only in patients who are not surgical candidates or if there are fragments left behind that cannot be removed. But again, if you do give this somebody lithostat, you need to check their CBCs and realize that they may not be able to stay on it. Cystinuria therapy. You want to get them under 250 milligrams per liter of cysteine a day. Look to the cysteine capacity on the 24-hour urine. Um, you would like to get them up to a cysteine capacity close to 48 if you can. Uh, this is really key on the 24-hour urine. These patients actually need to drink four liters a day. It's really difficult, but you'd like to get them up well over three quarts of urine a day. Low sodium diet may be helpful. Here you can alkalinize with potassium citrate, but when you go here from a pH of five to seven, unlike uric acid where the solubility increases 20 fold, for cysteine it only doubles. So again, important to do, simple to do. So the simplest thing is high fluid intake. The next simplest thing is alkalinize the urine. The third thing to do, and I emphasize the third thing, if you have to, is to put them on a thiol. So this can be alpha-mecalptropropanilglycine or thiopronin. You're gonna give up to 1,500 milligrams a day. You may give this with vitamin B650 a day. Remember, D-penicillamine is also in that same category. Um, it's poorly tolerated, but it's cheap. So again, something to keep in the back of your head. If somebody can't afford the high price of thiola, try D-penicillamine first. Alpha-mecaptopropanilglycine, again, it basically breaks the disulfide bond, so you get cysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E, -E, which is more soluble. Its side effects, mouth ulcers, nausea, low white count anemia, my favorite side effect of all, hypogusia, loss of taste. Um, but be careful, proteinuria and upwards of 25% need to stop therapy because of that. It does work. Now, very important article that came out from, from Peggy Pearl um, and another article that came out from Olivier Traxer. You really want to be sensitive to your patient's pocketbook. So in their in their study, the goal was a cysteine capacity of plus 100, um, which is fairly high. You know, other people will shoot for plus 48. But the bottom line is, in order to get there, all right, the first thing is increase the fluid intake. It costs nothing, and the only adverse effect, if you will, is they may wind up going to the bathroom more often. The second is to alkalinize the urine. The cost of that therapy, depending on what you want to give them, sodium bicarb, let's say, is very low, and adverse effects are also low. Potassium citrate in Traxure study was only 150, but in the United States, it may be upwards of $600 a, day, a month. Adverse effects, 10%. So these are the first two steps to take in your cystinuric. And if these don't work, and only if these don't work, then go to a thiol. Now, cost of thiola in the United States, unless the patient is able to apply for all sorts of other dispensations from the company, and in all fairness, the company does work with patients to make it more affordable, 7,000 a month. This is chemotherapy. Cost of deep penicillamine per month, $240. So try the deep penicillamine first. And if that doesn't work, then think about the thiola. But again, in all fairness, the company will work with your patients to make the thiola affordable.
AUA guidelines 2019 really didn't change much from 2016. Uh, Peggy Pearl and Dave Goldfarb and their, their associates have done a great job with this. But what becomes very clear is so we have hardly any level A evidence, prospective randomized studies, to support anything we're doing. This is the only level A evidence. They're on pharmacological therapy, do periodic blood tests to assess for adverse effects. This is grade B evidence, seven points. High risk recurrent or interested first time stone formers, 24 hour urine collection. They don't say one or two. Fluid intake to achieve two and a half liters per day. Calcium stone formers limit their sodium intake and have them on a normal calcium intake. In calcium stone formers, they're hypercalciuric, think about thiazides. Hypocitraturic, think about potassium citrate. If a calcium stone former is hyperuricosuric, then allopurinol. If you have a calcium stone former and all the parameters are normal and they're still forming more stones, you might consider giving thiazide with potassium citrate. Putting it all together, what should you do? This is my cost-effective pharmaceutical nihilism slide. First time stone former, talk to them about fluid and diet modification. That costs $133 a year if you're gonna get your follow-up, you know, CT scan or, or studies. But bottom line is in the study by Pearl and low 10, this cost $133 per year. Stone formation rate, 0.07 per year. If they have a second stone, Dr. Pearl would recommend potassium citrate, 20 milli equivalents three times a day. And their stone formation rate is only 0.057 at a cost of 990 per year. In my office, after they've had a second stone, we usually get the two 24-hour urines. If you do that, the cost is a bit more, um, but the stone formation rate falls by 12%, but it's gonna cost an extra $114 uh, per year. Everybody agrees if they have a third stone, get a full metabolic evaluation. So in conclusion, Diagnostics for metabolic stone evaluation, get your serum studies, any urinalysis, get the stone analysis. And if it's a recurrent, relatively young calcium oxalate stone former, get a bone density. 24 hour urine collection uh, is justifiable if they've had two or more stones or if they're first time stone former and they have multiple indications that they're gonna have another stone, i.e. they have other stones on presentation, a really strong family history, um, or very young. Therapeutic recommendations, dry diet and drink alone will work in a lot of your patients. And I would work with them to get them on proper uh, diet. <clears throat> Not only that, but in the patient with metabolic syndrome, you may convince them to actually decrease their overall intake, get on a proper diet, and if they lose the 40 to 50 pounds, all of a sudden, they're not hypertensive, they're not diabetic, they're not hyperlipidemic, and they're not forming stones. So William Oser said, one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine. I really think that we owe it to each person who comes to the office seeking our care to spend the extra five or 10 minutes to better understand their lifestyle and to help make suggestions that's gonna affect their diet. That could be the most important thing that you do for those individuals that are coming to you for help. For those who develop a second stone, either citrate therapy or 24-hour urine collection and directed therapy. If you select citrate therapy and they have a third stone episode, then do a 24 hour urine in those patients. Lastly, one more Osler quote, which I love diseases that harm require treatments that harm less. There's no less harmful treatment 
than learning how to eat properly and drink sufficiently. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Clement. That was an uh, excellent discussion. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, if you, um, so for, first question is, do you discuss and recommend 24 hour uh, urine analysis in pregnant patients with stones? No, I don't. Um, not offhand. I'm going to let, you know, they've got enough on their mind right there and then. And so I want to get them through their pregnancy and hopefully they'll deliver the stone in the child and uh, the child will be healthy and the stone will get crushed. Once that's done, then it all depends on do they have a positive family history? Is it their first stone? And I treat them like any other patient. Remember in pregnancy, the risk of stone disease is not increased because your increase in, high, in calcium in the urine is counterbalanced by increases in citrate. So for the pregnant woman, it's a zero sum game. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, and then there's another question. Um, so Dr. Hujaji asking, I believe I heard you say you will give allopurinol for calcium oxalate stones plus hyperuricosuria hyper stones but not for uric acid stones uh, with normal, um, can you please elaborate on this? Yeah, so in the patient with a uric acid stone, the, the first goal is alkalinizing the urine. Even if the urine uric acid is elevated, because if you successfully take the pH from five to seven, the solubility of that uric acid even if it's elevated, it's going to increase 20 fold. So that patient will be able to tolerate a higher than normal urine uric acid. That coupled with a low purine diet should be enough to prevent them from ever having another stone. Only if that fails would I consider allopurinol. And I can tell you in my practice over four decades now, I don't have a single uric acid stone former on allopurinol, not one. On the other hand, the patient with calcium oxalate stone disease, where the analysis, where the 24 hour urine comes back with elevated uric acid levels, even though the pH is six or seven, that patient may be having uric acid acting to help co-precipitate, if you will, the calcium oxalate crystals. That individual needs to drop their uric acid levels. That's a low purine diet, and if that fails, then allopurinol. I see. Uh, there's another question, but I think your you know, explanation for this question kind of addressed that, um, and that I think that's a wrap up. Okay. Uh, we have no more questions. All right, do we have any answers? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Clayman, again for your time today. And uh, this was an excellent uh, talk. And uh, for audience, if you if you guys have any other questions, uh, uh, please uh, post it on the uh, COVID USC UCSF website, and uh, we'll we'll do our best to answer that. Thank you, everybody. I'd like thank to you, thank every thank you uh, for listening today, and uh, Zam, thank you for an excellent job moderating and. I hope you come back from the space capsule uh, in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Falcon 9 is going to return soon. Signing off. <laughs>